we fix our eyes on you, our God, our good and faithful God. We continue to worship you here together.
faithfulness. God, we love you. God, we thank you for everything you do for us, God, for being the true God that you are. Lord, we give you all the praise. God, we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. All right, let's continue with our online service. Welcome to Cornerstone SF Online. I'm here inside of our Reardon campus at 175 Frida Kahlo Way, right opposite City College for San Francisco. Maybe you've never yet seen what it looks like inside. I'd love to encourage you to come and join us if you are local to the Bay Area or maybe you find yourself visiting one time. We'd love to see you. But wherever you're joining us today, thank you for stopping by to learn more about healthy love. In a moment, Pastor Terry is gonna continue the Healthy Love series, and we're gonna learn about the first part of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse four. Love is patient, love is kind. We're gonna explore what it looks like for love to show up in our lives and how we can be more patient and kind to other people. Before we do that, I'd love to encourage you, if you consider this your home church, to continue giving your tithes and your offerings as you are so faithful in doing. You can do so by clicking the Give tab. You might see it there at the top of your screen. It's a blue icon saying Give. You can also find the link to our giving page in the description or the comments below. You can give on our app. It's free, it's easy, and it's very safe. Or if you prefer old school tactile methods, you can mail in a check to our offices at the address found on screen. But with all of that, here's Pastor Terry now continuing our Healthy Love series. What a blessing to be able to share this time with all of you, my friends, my brothers and sisters, those of you who are near, those of you who are far, those of you who are part of our Cornerstone online community, and those of you who are joining us for the very first time. And if that's you, I'm Pastor Terry, the lead pastor here at Cornerstone Church in San Francisco, and we're so happy you're with us right now. You know, what we've been pursuing since the beginning of the year is a better understanding of healthy love. That's what our series is called, Healthy Love. And our focus has been on the great love chapter of the Bible. That's what it's, been, it's what it's called, 1 Corinthians 13, often read at weddings. But our purpose is to understand how God defines healthy love and then to increase its presence in our lives so that we are loving ourselves in a healthy way as God wants us to, so that we are loving God in a way that he invites us to, and so that we are loving others better in a way that is healing and life-giving and not creating pain. So as we've been doing for the past two weeks, we, we're going to open up and read the short chapter through 1 Corinthians 13. Instead of though reading it from the ESV, which is the version we typically use here, I'm actually going to read it from a far... Uh, well, less familiar and certainly less used version. It's actually a version that I came across many years ago and was introduced to it by my grandfather. It's called the Weymouth New Testament. And it was far more popular at the turn of the 20th century. So the, actually we would say the turning into the 20th century. So the early 1900s was when uh, this version was first made public. And uh, it's, it's beautiful, very similar, but it has some slight nuance. And so as a way of just keeping things fresh, I want to read it from this Weymouth translation. And we'll put the words up, but you know, we all need more of this love. Come on, to flow in and out of us. We do. We need less angry words. We need to have less bitterness of, of heart, certainly. More for, forgiveness, less anxious thoughts, more peace. We need more of his love. So let's keep that in mind as we read this. We'll just read it through. 
The apostle writes, if I can speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but am destitute of love, I but become a loud sounding trumpet or a clanging cymbal. And if I possess the gift of prophecy and I'm versed in all mysteries and all knowledge, like, wow, and have such absolute faith that I can remove mountains, but am destitute of love, I, I'm nothing. And if I distribute all my possessions to the poor, think about that, and give up my body to be burned, but am destitute of love, it, it profits me nothing. This is what love is. Love is patient and kind. I'm going to talk about that today. Love knows neither envy nor jealousy. Love is not forward and self-assertive. It's not boastful and conceited. She does not behave unbecomingly, nor seek to aggrandize herself, nor blaze out in passionate anger, nor brood over wrongs. Hmm. She finds no pleasure in injustice done to others, but joyfully sides with the truth. She knows how to be silent. She can overlook faults. She is full of trust, full of hope, full of patient endurance. You see, love never fails. But if there are prophecies, they will be done away with. If there are languages, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be brought to an end. For our knowledge actually is imperfect, and so is our prophesying. But when the perfect state of things has come, that's ahead of us, by the way. When the perfect state of things has come, all that is imperfect will be brought to an end. When I was a child, I talked like a child, felt like a child, reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put from me childish ways. <laughs> I say, I hope I'm doing better on that, Lord. For the present, we see things, think about this, as if in a mirror, and we're puzzled. So much of the things that we don't understand about what is ahead of us, about eternity, about heaven, about hell, about all the things that Jesus talked about. For we see things as if in a mirror and are puzzled. But then, someday, we shall see them face to face. For the present, the knowledge I gain is imperfect, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And so there remain faith, hope, love, these three. And of these, the greatest is love. Ah, Lord, we come before you right now as open as we can possibly be. We want more of your love to work in our lives. And that means we need to be open to welcome you in honestly, humbly, sincerely into the places you want to go so that you can continue to transform our lives with your presence, with your spirit, with your life giving, transforming power. So we come to you, yes, in our brokenness, in our sinfulness, in our need. And we ask you to meet us and to speak to us and to be with us, even as we break the bread of this word together. Let there be a flow of wisdom and life and love in Jesus' name. Amen. You're so loved. So now we begin our journey to look about what Christian healthy life-giving love looks like. And of course, it was the kind of love that was personified and, well, it was modeled by Jesus. If you want to really understand God's love, we just got to look at Jesus, which is why there's <laughs> such a huge benefit in reading the Gospels, because we get to understand how Jesus engaged human beings and lived his life and talked and walked. And there's so much to learn from our Lord and how he lived because he really is. Jesus is God's tangible revelation of healthy love. There's no question about that. And the more that we, you and me, follow in his steps, the more our life will be characterized by the healthy love he modeled. I want to say that one more time. The more that we follow in his steps, God's love in human form, Jesus, the more we follow in the steps of Jesus, the more our life will be characterized by the healthy love that he modeled. And as we shared last week, our goal, it's not so much to pursue the qualities. This is an important distinction. 
as it is to pursue the one whose real presence at work in our lives allows those qualities to flow naturally from our lives. You know, Dallas Willard, the late author and Christian sage, he was a philosopher, but a genuine lover of God. He thought a lot about this and his expertise was helping us understand what it means to be an apprentice of Jesus. And he wrote about these things. And, and there was one book that he, in which he shared, it's actually called Life Without Lack. He shared about this. In fact, he talks directly about 1 Corinthians 13, what we, we have been looking at, what we're going to continue to look at together. Look what he says. He says, when we read 1 Corinthians 13, it's, it is important to understand that Paul is not issuing commands right? Do this and do that. He's not saying that we ought to be patient, ought to be kind, ought to be humble and so forth. He is describing, Willard points out, love, Christian love, healthy love, Jesus love, the Jesus way. He's describing love as having these characteristics, these qualities. That, after all, is what the passage actually says. So we pursue love, listen, loved ones, by advancing our faith and dying to self through appropriate training and practice. We call those the Christian disciplines. And the love we receive from God, well, that just takes care of the rest. These virtues, the ones that we're going to be looking at, sitting with again in the coming weeks, starting with today, they arise from the overall disposition of love because love by its very nature seeks what is good and right before God. So again, I, I don't think I can uh, overemphasize this. The goal is to become a Christ-infused, loving person more than trying to do loving things. The goal is to become a Christ-infused, loving person more than trying to do loving things. It's not bad to try to do loving things or to not do unloving things, but I mean, it's not as effective. It won't have the strength, the substance that comes from living close to Christ so that these loving qualities flow freely out of our life as we engage the Lord and make room for his word and presence as the highest priority of our life or as a quest, as it were. In other words, the more that we focus on him and having more of his reality at work in our life, because God is love and Jesus is love given to us. I mean, he's, he is God's love in human form because we, we have him at work in our lives. These are the things that start to flow out of our lives. So I think we make a mistake when we say, I want to try to be more loving. I want to try to have these qualities. I'm going to learn about these qualities of love that are described here in first Corinthians 13 so that I can be more loving. It's not a bad thing. It's just the best thing is to pursue Jesus. And as we pursue him and have his presence in our lives in real and meaningful ways that are growing and expanding, what will happen is the natural byproduct of that will be these qualities will show up more and more and more in us. And they won't be forced. They'll be who we are. So because healthy, another way of saying it is because healthy love flows from God, the ultimate lover, right? <laughs> I mean, God is love. He's holy and complete love. And when his love is flowing in and out of us, we become a light, a reflection. Yeah, even a prism of that love. Like it flows out in different directions. It was C.S. Lewis who said in the book that I referred to last week, in the four loves, he says, it's easy to acknowledge, but almost impossible to realize for long that we are mirrors whose brightness, if we are bright, is wholly derived from the sun that shines upon us. So we're just really reflections of the light when we're at our best in Christ. Can we see it's one of the reasons why Jesus said that we are to seek first the kingdom of God, that is God's loving realm, the kingdom of God, and his righteousness. Not what the culture tells us is right. The culture preaches, you know. They preach righteousness according to their version 
of the scripture, but we live by a different, a different scripture. We live by righteousness as defined in the Bible as God's righteousness, what is right in his eyes. And those things sometimes con conflict. The culture is not always in alignment with, with God. In fact, often, most often it, it's not. Now there's overlaps, but there's a lot of difference too. And when it comes to those differences, we are to follow God. But anyway, Jesus said this, seek first the kingdom of God and, and his righteousness. And then all these things will be added unto you. That is, stay with me here. They will flow naturally out of your life, which is exactly what we're getting at here. It just flows out. It's who you are. You start to look like kingdom kids, if I can put it that way. And that's what we want to do. So let's talk about 1 Corinthians 13. And now we shift into what love looks like. And all we're going to do today is talk about the beginning portion of verse four, where we're told that love is patient and love is kind. The older version says, love suffers long. The message says love never gives up. I'm talking about this kind of love. And what it does, if we could just push into this a little bit further, what it reminds us of is that love does a, a couple of things. One, practically speaking, it creates space. And what I mean by that is it gives people room to grow, time to grow, space to grow. There's love has a relational compassion that doesn't grind people down when they fail or disappoint us. And that it, it could, look, we're all going to need grace from time to time. That's why Jesus, when he said, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. We need to remember that because we're all going to need mercy. Sometimes we're too quick to cut off people. Sometimes we're not being loving because we're not giving them room to grow space to grow. And I'm not suggesting that there aren't times when we need to draw a line and create healthy boundaries. I get all of that, but there's just something about love that is kind. And there's a, a relational compassion. I mean, when people say they love, love the Lord and when the reality of Jesus is in our lives, it's going to show up in our tenderness to other people and kindness. And if it's not showing up, there's something wrong with our relationship with the Lord. How, how can I say this? How, how many of us <laughs> are thankful the Lord is patient with us? I know I am. I, boy, I've been stubborn. I've been proud. I've been disobedient. I've been willful. I've been foolish. And yet Jesus loves me and he calls me up. You know, we can become so exacting with people. And I'm not suggesting, like I mentioned, there's not a time to draw that line. There's that there's no need for consequences or, as I mentioned, need for healthy boundaries. That's, that's also, as we're going to see, part of what love actually does, <laughs> right? It rejoices in truth. It's safe. But love is patient, we're told here. It starts off. Love is patient. And wasn't that the Jesus way? I mean, when we read the Gospels, and how good it is for us to immerse ourselves in the Gospels from time to time, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to really sit with the, the Gospels in the way of Jesus. It's one of the reasons why I love that, that show, The Chosen, which is just an interpretation of the Gospels. But I love it. It's like a painting. It gives us a version of who Jesus was, and I find it so compelling. But when I think about the Lord and how patient and kind he was, whether it it's a wayward searching, but relationally dysfunctional Samaritan woman at a well. John 4, you read that chapter. It's one of the great chapters of the scriptures. Whether it's a, a searching woman by at the well or an impetuous disciple with a distorted perspective of his own capacities. I mean, you want to talk about Simon Peter. He's got a lot of stuff going on. He's got his own version of an inferior, inferiority 
complex with an insecurity complex at the same time he's a natural leader. I mean, he's got all this stuff happening. He has a tendency to overestimate his own capacities and Jesus works with him. Sometimes he jumps the gun and just makes a fool out of himself every now and then he'll stumble, in, stumble into something that's like brilliant, spirit inspired. But a lot of times we love him so much because we get to see his failure and Jesus loved him. He loved him. He loved him in spite of his flaws, saw what he could become. He can become a rock. My man, I'm giving you that name because you're going to learn. You're going to learn how to trust me. Whether it was a woman by a well who didn't know how to engage, love well, tried to find it in all the men in her life and nothing satisfied her. Or a disciple who <laughs> got in his own way half the time, Peter, or a prostitute. Don't ask feet. Stoner, they cried. You who are without sin, throw the first stone in. Yeah, woman, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. Whether it was, well, I think of other figures. I think of <laughs> a corrupt little tax collector who climbed up in a sycamore tree. You know who I'm talking about, many of you, Zacchaeus, who didn't seem to like himself very much, but Jesus worked with him. Or a lost, demonized, tormented soul like Mary of Magdala, or a disciple who refused to believe unless he could see, you show me it, unless I see it, I won't believe it. That's right, I'm talking about Thomas or a raging bull of a man intent on wiping out a blasphemous movement called the way and eradicating all the followers of Jesus, the Nazarene. I know I jumped one more book down into the fifth, I sometimes call the book of Acts, the fifth gospel, but I'm talking about Saul of Tarsus, who God transforms, Jesus transforms. He says, I saw him, I met him on the road, changed my life, changed my life. Paul, as he later would be named, never forgot his past, how much he needed God's mercy and kindness, how ashamed he was that he was, as he said, a murderer and a blasphemer. He called himself the least of the apostles that in some ways he said, I'm the greatest of sinners. I mean, ah, Jesus worked with him, right? Jesus worked with them all. And the irony of course, was that that last one, the one I called the raging bull, he was the one that God uses to write these words. I'm talking about Paul, right? Saul of Tarsus, Paul the Apostle, writes 1 Corinthians 13, and he never forgot. And whenever his prodigious intellect, his religious pedigree, or his, yeah, I'll just say it, incomparable spiritual revelations, some of which are described in the epistles, whenever those things tempted him to a place of pride. He would fall back on his past and the undeserved love. He called it the grace of God that he received from Jesus and he would rest there. It would be, it would become to him a mooring point for his life. I mean, look at what he wrote in first Timothy and how wonderful it illustrates. Well, wonderfully it illustrates everything we've been talking about. Look what he says. I referred to it, but here's what he actually says. First Timothy chapter one, I'm just going to read 12 through 17. It's from the NLT. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him. Even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ in my insolence, I persecuted his people, but God, there it is. Talk about the kindness of God. God had mercy on me. I, I did it in ignorance and unbelief, but I still did it. And oh, how generous can any of us relate to this? Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. Still is. He filled me with the faith and love that come from Christ Jesus. And this is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. And Paul says, I'm the worst of them all, but God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great, there it is, patience. Love is patient with even the worst sinners. 
And then others will realize that they too can believe him and receive eternal life. All honor and glory to God forever and ever. Paul can't hold it back. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. The closer we live to his love, mercy, and grace, the more we, we, we will be compelled to offer it to others. I'll just say that one more time. The closer we live to his love, mercy, and grace, the more we will be compelled to offer it to others because love, well, love is patient and love is kind. And this reminds me of something else that love actually doesn't do. Remember, I mentioned that love gives space for people, right? It gives them the ability, as we referred to earlier, to grow. But one of the things that love doesn't do is love doesn't keep score. I mean, can you imagine if God kept score on us? <laughs> we come to him broken, hurting, repentant, regretful. He says, sorry, uh, sorry, my daughter. Sorry, my son. Uh, you know what? You reached the mercy limit. You hit it. I, I mean, I was hoping you wouldn't get there, but you hit it. <laughs> so no more love. No more love for you. Come on, we know that's not how God works. I mean, God is, is good to the just and the unjust. He is kind and full of mercy. I'm talking about tender mercy. God is full of tender mercy. And that doesn't mean there aren't any consequences to sin. I, I, I know that's not the case. If that were the case, there would be no need for a savior and a cross. There would be no need for Jesus. Certainly no need for him to die in our place. There is such a thing, again, as Jesus taught us about eternal life and death. There is such a thing as a heaven and a hell. However, we in our present state try to imagine it based on the words that we were told about. One thing we know at its core, hell is to be separated from God and heaven is to be in his presence. And wherever God's presence is, there is light and life. Just like the sun, things can grow. Wherever there is no light, no life, no warmth, no sun, death reigns. God, there's just no limit to his love. God is love. And of course, not only does love <laughs> create space, room for people to grow, not only does love not keep score. So if you're keeping score on somebody, come on, don't do it. Don't do it. But love also leans into kindness. And kindness is such an underestimated virtue because when God's at work in our lives, we're going to be more kind. We are. Now, that doesn't mean that only people who follow Jesus or who engage in the healthy love of Christ can be kind. I've met a lot of people who are kind in this world. That's part of even, even when people aren't living in relationship with the Lord, there's the capacity for kindness that I think comes from God's image placed into every human being. But there's also this other side of human beings is incredibly capable of evil, like incredible evil, devastating evil. Uh, human history is a testimony to how little life can be regarded. We see it all the time. Senseless violence, unkindness, manipulation. I could go on exploitation. It's there, but that's not what we're talking about. I'm not going to talk about that. I don't want to push that far. I'm simply going to say is that love leans into kindness. That's what I want to say. And in Proverbs 31, when the virtuous woman, this woman of excellence, is being described. One of her outstanding qualities is kindness. Listen to this, Proverbs 31, 25 and 26. She is clothed with strength and dignity and she laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise and she gives instructions with kindness. Kindness is an expression of love and it takes on many forms. It could be a smile. <laughs> it could be a smile. It could be a kind word. It could be an affirmation a touch of affirmation, a gentle touch of affirmation. It could be a listening ear. Sometimes it says nothing. It's just present. It can be a note, a text, an encouraging word, a message we share, an act of inclusion, an attentiveness to someone who Others aren't noticing. These are all kind things that love does. You know, don't 
I don't think we should underestimate the powerful effect of kindness and the profound impact it can have on someone's life. I think the reason I love Victor Hugo's Le Miserable, not just because it was turned into this magnificent musical, but because it, if you read it, the story, it has something of the gospel in it, the transforming power of the love of Christ. It was, as some of you may recall, the undeserved kindness of the bishop that broke a man chained to anger and resentment and bitterness of soul, Jean Valjean. He changed him. It changed his life. Maybe some of us can remember, still even now, though years may have passed, a kind word that was said to us or a kind deed that was done to us that has reverberated in our life. Or maybe it was just the gentle presence of a kind one in our lives. Some of us have had that from grandparents or special people who've crossed our path. And maybe they're gone now, but they're even now ministering to us. Uh, they're ministering life to us because of the kindness in their legacy, right? the kindness of who they were to us. You know, kindness lives. And God's love reminds us that a simple seed of kindness, a cup of water, so to speak, can blossom into a tree of life. A kind gesture, uh, Steve Maraboli wrote, can reach a wound that only compassion can heal. A kind gesture can reach a wound that only compassion can heal. So as we close, we've got a song that we're going to share in a moment, and then I'm going to come back around with a final thought. But I, again, love is patient. Love is kind. We're now pushing into what love is. And when we get close to Jesus, that love shows up in our lives. And it shows up like this. This is one of the ways it shows up. It needs to show up like this. And what does that love do? It creates space so that people have room to grow, time to grow. Oh, sometimes we're so impatient. Lord, help us. It doesn't keep score. That's easy to do. Don't do that. Don't do the I love you if you love me thing. That's not how Christ's love is. And what love does is it leans into kindness. And that's most beautifully displayed when it's perhaps least deserved. So Lord, help us to love more like you. That's our prayer. In your name, yeah, we do pray this. We really do. Let's keep that in mind as we share this song.
came around to know the real you, how your heart beats for me, and every day you show me new ways that your heart beats for me, and I can't wait to journey knowing that your heart beats for me, broken down. The love of Christ at work in us, the love of Christ so freely given, the love of Christ that Jesus modeled, the love of Christ that flows from the presence of the real Christ in our lives. I know God wants us to be more loving people. I know He wants us to be more kind. May we be responsive to the Lord. May, may you, Lord Jesus, be so real in our lives that the darkness must be chased away. Keep us from the short fuse and an angry spirit and the unforgiving way. Teach us your way. Help us to be patient. Help us to be kind. Help us to be merciful because you were, you were and are all these things to us. So may the love of Christ keep you. May his goodness be upon you and may his healing touch be yours in every way. I pray life over you. I pray love and life over you, in your spirit, in your body, yeah, in your soul and in your mind. That's my prayer for all of us, in Jesus' name.